All right, let's just get this over with. The brain trust at Marvel brings the current run and Zeb Wells' turn on the series to an end the only way it could. If you have any doubt in your mind before we get started, this is not going to be a positive review. Let's just see you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Amazing Spider-Man number 60. You know, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a rhetorical question, but I think it's going to frame everything that comes afterward. How do you define the word nothing? To the average person in the average context of his or her life, nothing is effectively the absence of substance or value, which is as good a definition as any if you're looking for one. Writer Zeb Wells ends his run on Amazing Spider-Man by doing nothing, penning a final issue devoid of substance or value. At best, you could say this final issue is a perfect encapsulation of the series as a whole. Nothing. Before we dig in, let's recap what happened last time to Peter Parker in Amazing Spider-Man number 59. Spidey finished up his multi-issue fight against Tombstone, of which there was no plot, barely any dialogue, no dramatic progression of any sort, just two guys fighting. The issue ended with both combatants surviving, and Janice, Tombstone's daughter, escaped her father's murderous intentions. The issue ended with Tombstone back in police custody. So that brings us to the current issue, which is the last issue in the run, the last issue from Zeb Wells. In Amazing Spider-Man number 60, Tombstone's trial resumes. To absolutely nobody's surprise, the judge dismisses the case because no witness besides Spider-Man can confirm that Tombstone tried to kill Janice. And Janice, the lead witness in the original case, left town to avoid death by dad. To add insult to injury, Tombstone quietly tells Peter Parker afterwards as they exit the courthouse together that he bribed the judge and that he got away with everything. Except killing his daughter because she's now gone. No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You might be thinking, that's it? You mean to say the entire Tombstone arc, from start to finish, including the setup in this last piece of it, that was meant to get him arrested through the end of Wells' run, amounted to effectively nothing? And that's what you, being one of the smartest comic readers around, might wonder. To that I say, yes, you are correct. The end of Tombstone's arc, much like Zeb Wells' run, amounts to nothing. Nothing but a waste of paper. Later, Peter visits Aunt May at the Feast Soup Kitchen for a casual visit when the original Sandman, Flint Marco, coincidentally attacks an armored bank truck directly in front of Feast. Peter makes his typical excuses to leave Aunt May's side and fight Sandman. Spidey wins with the help of a gadget he had handy from his brief stint as Spider Goblin and saves the day. Aunt May takes the opportunity to lecture Spider-Man about his dangerous association with Peter Parker, of course, because she loves her nephew. In kind, however, Spider-Man lectures Aunt May about letting Peter help because that's who he is. In effect, the two characters who know each other but not realize they know each other come to terms with letting people be who they are. That's it. That's the end. Now you might think to yourself, wait a minute, Mr. Reviewer Guy. There's nothing more Zeb Wells could do to salvage the terrible run and leave at least on some kind of a high note? No, no, there is nothing Zeb Wells can do to salvage his run. It's a failure and will forever be remembered as a dark time in Spider-Man history. But, you know, if it's any consolation and you really did find some enjoyment in this run, editor Nick Lowe is sticking around to make sure Amazing Spider-Man doesn't get any better than it is right now. Take that for what it's worth. But wait a minute, I'll, I'll give them a, a small conceit, or at least a little bit of credit. If you can't get enough of Zeb Wells' defacement of old Webhead, Marvel decided to give him a few short stories to justify the bloated cover price and to fill out a bunch of pages with stuff you don't need. Starting with Doctor's Orders. Spider-Man takes Wreck Rap, everybody's favorite character from the Dark Web event, to a doctor to check out a severe bruise caused by Wreck Rap's reckless use of a goblin glider. The vignette ends, and it's really not even a story, it's just a vignette, with Wreck Rap launching out of the doctor's office window on his goblin glider, telling Spider-Man to take a break for the night because he's the one that's going to be on patrol. <laughs> yuck, 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 ha, ha, ho, ho, ha. Zeb Wells is so hilarious with this endlessly annoying Wreck Rap character that never should have been invented because he completely diffused the dramatic tension in the awful dark web event. Maybe Zeb Wells should try writing comedy or something because he's certainly got a knack for it. Or, if you can hear the sarcasm in my voice, no, there is nothing funny about Rec Rap, this vignette, or the inclusion of it in the final issue to justify a $7.99 cover price. I'll say that again, a $7.99 cover price. 
The next short is entitled Team Up Part 2. Spider-Man and Jackpot, everybody's favorite superhero version of MJ Watson, battles the Dichromator, a demon from another dimension who manipulates and draws power from the colors of our world. Thanks to Jackpot's roll of all wilds on her magic bracelets, the demon is defeated. Later, Jackpot and Spidey brief J. Jonah about the Dichromator's defeat when they both realize they're late for a double date with Paul and Shay. Oh, oh he, it's coming. You can already tell where this is going. The two rush off to the restaurant. Before they enter, MJ thanks Peter for coming to save her from the alternate dimension in the now infamous What Did Peter Do arc that brought Paul and MJ together. This short story is, I guess, fine for what it is as a whole, but the last moments are a heartbreaking insult to Amazing Spider-Man fans everywhere. Editor Nick Lowe continues to draw increasing amounts of heat for not allowing Peter and MJ to get back together as a couple. And yet, Lowe sees fit to publish a story that shows MJ in a supposedly committed, healthy relationship with one of the most hated characters in Marvel, Paul. It's hard not to argue this ending was approved out of spite. Look, Nick Lowe can publish all the letters he wants in the back of his comic, even the ones that he secretly writes for himself. I think that's pretty much a given at this point. But Peter and MJ belong together. They are a staple. It's always been that way. It should be that way. And Marvel continuing to keep them apart simply out of stubbornness and spite is foolish. And as long as they keep doing it, they will not have the respect of the readership. And we'll just leave it at that. In the next short called Bubs, and if you haven't gotten the motif yet, basically Zeb Wells is giving you little short stories with respect to all the, the highlight characters Spidey is associated with, although Wolverine has never really been one of them, so I'm not sure what's going on here, but oh well. Spidey and Wolverine share a drink at a bar on a snowy night. It turns out their meeting is an annual event to quietly celebrate Wolverine's birthday. The short ends with a cheerful farewell, and that's all there is to it. I'm not sure why Zeb Wells had a hankering to pair Wolverine and Spidey for a birthday ritual, but it works well enough as a nice scene, a bit of a sweet moment, and that's all it is to it. Nice, forgettable, but nice. The last short in this series of backups for a goodbye tour, if you want to call it that, is called Mirrors, or same spider channel depending on which page you look at. Nick Lowe couldn't even get that right. Spider-Man battles Bushwhacker, who claims to want payback against Spidey for their previous fight in Texas. It turns out Bushwhacker doesn't know the Spider-Man he fought was Peter's clone, Ben, who stepped in as Spider-Man on behalf of the Beyond Corporation for a brief period of time. So we're getting back to the Beyond stuff. Suddenly, Ben, now Chasm, swoops in and knocks Bushwhacker out with his psychoactive goo. Later, Ben and Peter share a cup of coffee at a diner. There, Ben admits his obsession with Peter is now over. He's in his relationship with Hollow's Eve. They're moving on with their lives. He's trying to get his head together. Everything is good, and he intends to move on by keeping his nose clean. Secretly, however, Chasm is far from moving on, and it looks like he might be planning something pretty big and pretty nasty for Spider-Man. It's unclear why this short is here, or even why specifically Zeb Wells wrote it. The outcome suggests a setup for a larger story that pits Spider-Man against Chasm, but if that's the case, Zeb Wells won't be writing it. So why is it here? I don't know, and it doesn't necessarily speak to what's coming up for the next writer on board, which is, I think, going to be Joe Casey. So it's here, it's perfectly okay, but it's a setup that doesn't appear to be going anywhere. And that's all the content we have in this $7.99 issue. I'm going to say that again, $7.99 issue. So what's great about Amazing Spider-Man number 60? Of course, this is going to be really short. It's over. If you're looking for a silver lining, that's it. No more of Zeb Wells' terrible new characters, corny humor, or arcs and events that accomplish nothing and lead nowhere. It's over. It's done. Put it in the box. Throw it in the river. Let it go. Let's move on. But of course, we have to talk about what's not great about Amazing Spider-Man number 60. Let's put the backups and the short stories aside, which artificially inflate the cover price to a ridiculous $7.99, and talk about the main issue and what's the big downside there. The one positive point of Zeb Wells' run was his work with Tombstone on that first arc. But even in the end, which caps the entire run, the conflict with Tombstone amounted to nothing. Taken as a whole, from issue number one to issue number 60, you could legitimately wipe it away from all memory and all reality in existence, and nothing of value will have been lost. Nothing was progressed, nothing was accomplished, nothing was changed, nothing of value was gained. Future generations will look upon this work from Zeb Wells and what he did with Amazing Spider-Man as a case study and how to do exactly everything wrong. 
final thoughts. What do we think about Amazing Spider-Man number 60? It ends the series and Zeb Wells' tenure the only way it could, by accomplishing nothing, proving that all 60 issues were a waste of time and money. If you throw out Wells' run, you won't remember it as anything more than a bad dream, and your appreciation of comics will probably only just improve. If Zeb Wells hears this run, I'm going to address this directly to you, Zeb. Goodbye. Good luck. I hope you find better success somewhere else, but you won't be missed. Therefore, Amazing Spider-Man number 60 earns a 4 out of 10. The sooner we can move on from this travesty, the better. But what do you think? Am I being too harsh on Marvel? Was this run better than I'm giving it credit for? Leave a thumbs up if you think I'm just a grumpy Gus and I'm not appreciating the good things when I have them. And drop a comment below with what was great about Zeb Wells' run on ASM that I'm missing. Or, you know what? Leave a comment and tell me that I'm 100% right. I'm, I'm open to some back pats and validation. Sure, I'll, I'll take that. Also, remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review. Check out the variant covers and preview pages and buy this comic to help support the channel. Of course, your support, even for bad comics, is still greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.